one. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining this week's media briefing. Uh, my name is Jerome Fletcher. I'm an assistant chief administrative officer in the office of the county executive. Today I am moderating this briefing due to the fact that we are going to discuss some information on some business development, um, new opportunities that we want to share with you today. Um, the first half of this briefing today will be about the economic advisory group. And the second half will have Dr. Gales and Dr. Spotter provide the weekly update during the second half of the meeting going over our numbers and information on our public health situation. Just wanna give everyone a heads up that uh, at the start that we are going to have a 120 cutoff. Uh, that's when the meeting will end the recording. We will be able to hang around and still have conversation and questions from the media and the Zoom will be made available for everyone to view after that. I do wanna introduce our speakers today. Um, Again, I am Jerome Fletcher. We have our County Executive, Mark Elric. We have Council President, Sydney Katz. We have our County Health Officer, Dr. Travis Gales. We have our County Recovery Manager, Dr. Earl Stoddard. Our Doug Furstenberg, who is the Chair of the Economic Advisory Group and Principal for Stonebridge, as well as Angela Graham, President and CEO of Quality Biological Incorporated. We also have Ron Pierre Vincenti, PhD, CEO of US Pharmacopoeia. Uh, let me remind reporters that you need to request permission to record, and if you have any questions, to put them in the chat and identify the news organization that you represent. Uh, this is a media briefing, so as usual, we're only taking questions from the media, and once again, we are on a tight time frame, and please use your chat, and we will get to your questions as soon as we can. And now I'm going to turn it over to the County Executive, Mark Elridge. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. and. Uh, I especially want to thank the uh, Economic Advisory Group for being here. Uh, we're mixing it up a little bit, but we think this is important enough to talk about that we're making this part of our press briefing this week. Um, the Economic Advisory Group was chaired by Doug Furstenberg, and I want to thank him and all the members of that group for the work they've done. I want to thank the county staff, Daniel Croma and Tina Benjamin, who also worked in this, and of course, of course, um, Jerome Fletcher for his work on this. This, is, this has been um, one of our most important projects. This group began meeting, has been meeting since July, and it was part of our overall recovery framework. But we know that simply trying to recover where we were before this crisis hit is not enough. And since I've been in office, we've been looking at how do we move economic development and opportunities forward in the county. And so this group was convened to deal both with the present, but more importantly, with the future of Montgomery County. Not only how do I recover from what hit us, but how do we move forward to do some of the things that we really need to do. Uh, this group represented um, large and small and minority businesses and women-owned businesses. Uh, we had representation from critical industries such as hospitality, bio and life sciences banking, information technology, healthcare, and others. And I put together this group of diverse business stakeholders to explore the long-term efforts needed by Montgomery County and its stakeholders to recover from the pandemic and go beyond. And to take advantage of the assets and build Montgomery County better than ever before. And there are a couple of things I really want to highlight because these are things that I've been working on since I came in and they really reflect um, the priorities that we're trying to drive. Um, first is, in order to attract investment, we need to change the reputation we've earned about our um, approval processes, particularly in permitting. And uh, I wanna say that we have begun to streamline those processes. That work is already in place. It's being carried forward. And our goal is to make this as simple, direct, straightforward as it can be. Um, no gotchas, no tricks, and with a customer service attitude where we actually help people solve problems rather than simply tell people you got it wrong. Uh, we have to get to the point of being able to tell people if they got something wrong, what they need to do to fix it. So that is one thing we're working on and it's something we're going to continue to do because 
we need to change the perception that we're a difficult place to do business. We've already had some successes and we intend to build on that. Second is that we need a dedicated county infrastructure fund. Um, we are not able to fund infrastructure. We cannot do what similar sized and even smaller counties are able to do in terms of funding infrastructure. So we lag and we continue to lag seriously in the transportation front. Um, I'll say, you know, when I, 12 years ago, I proposed the bus rapid transit network for the county. We have a light version of it on one road, which is Route 29, and we're still working to put this in place. We need to be able to create funding so that we can put the infrastructure in place so we can replicate the efforts that are made across the river because we know that infrastructure and particularly transportation infrastructure has been singled out by the business community as one of the leading impediments to economic development, not just in Montgomery County, but in the region. And so I'm glad this is acknowledged in this report. Second, regarding housing, we need to be able to produce housing across all groups, but the report acknowledges that almost three fourths of the housing that's gonna be needed by 2040 is for households who are below median income and fully 25% of the housing is for households that are between 30 and 50% of median income. That this is what our work, this is the workforce that is coming here in part, and this is a workforce we have to be able to house. So I appreciate those recommendations especially. And the fourth thing is this talks about the, um, the need to create a um, postgraduates research center at White Flint. We sit on enormous assets here, um, but what we don't have in Montgomery County is a graduate level, postgraduate level research facility that can build on the work that's done on NIH and FDA, and also in our amazing life sciences um, area, and we need to be able to provide that there. And what we're looking at is Montgomery County has a joint development agreement with WMATA. We're looking at the WMATA Metro site. Our goal is to try to bring a postgraduate research center there, along with focusing that site's development on the biotech industry and artificial intelligence. And we marry those two together because those two, th those two areas are being married together in the world of on bio research today. And we need to be on the cutting edge of this. We are, you know, in the leading three, third or fourth county in the country for life sciences. We are the center of vaccine development. And if anything has come out of COVID has, has shown just what a prominent role we play there. So to move Montgomery County forward, we need lots of work and involvement. It's gonna involve the county, the business community, the Economic Development Corporation our nonprofit community and our workforce development partners. We all need to work together. We have to pull in the same direction. We have to work our way through some of these challenges and we have to be able to put in place the ingredients that'll let Montgomery County be what it should be. And that's the work that's in front of it. That's the work we intend to do. Usually such groups as the EAG take a long time to write a report and produce re results but not this one. And I'm proud to announce that we even have a new bio boot camp. Details will come from EAG Chair Furstenberg, um, but the bio boot camp that will have an impact on the county and will put an unemployed workers back to work by leveraging a small business opportunity. And I wanna thank Angela Graham especially for her role in this. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Doug and committee members to speak about the EAG. And afterwards, Dr. Gales and I will provide the public health update. Thank you very much. Council, uh, Council President Katz, you're muted. Give us just a second here. Okay, you should be good to go. Okay, thank you. It, uh, it's, I'm Sydney Katz, I'm the council president for this 
this year. And I believe all, all uh, discussions anymore start by saying, am I muted or am I unmuted? <clears throat> and I just proved that. So uh, thank you, Mr. County Executive, for, for, uh, for those statements that you just made. And I know that I've been allotted no more than three minutes to speak today. And as many of you know who know me, know I'm someone who always tries to come in under budget, and I believe I will. It has truly been my pleasure to serve alongside the many prominent business leaders, some of whom you're going to hear from in just a few moments, who have served on the Economic Advisory Group. My involvement in the uh, economic success of Air County is, is longstanding. I uh, am a person who had previously owned and operated a small business that was started by my grandparents in 1918. And just before I uh, ran for the Montgomery County Council, I closed that business. But I was also very pleased to work with the county executive as the council lead during the four business initiative, which was an initiative that took place before the pandemic. It was where we had discussions throughout the, the, the geograph all of the geographic areas of the county. And we heard directly from businesses what was and was not working. Businesses, especially small businesses, are so very important to each of us, whether it's because it's our occupation or because we're customers. We need to do our best to keep them vital. It's so important that while we tackle the enormity of the economic crisis brought on by the global pandemic, that we also focus on our post-COVID strategic economic recovery planning. The EAG is doing just that, and the future benefits of this work will help us pivot, rebound, and once again, succeed. I want to thank Doug and Angela and Ron and Jerome and Tina and everyone else who has worked together on this endeavor, because I'm a strong believer that when we all work together and listen to each other, that is how we will truly have a better solution. So thank you very much. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Doug Furstenberg. Thank you, Council President Katz and, and County Executive uh, Elridge. Um, we're gonna hear some very sobering news from Dr. Gills. Uh, I mean, obviously the trend lines are not where any of us would like them to be. And some people might ask, why are we focused on recovery? Well, it's just what the two leaders of the county just said. We have to be ready to recover so that way as we come out of this pandemic, which we will, that the county is positioned to succeed and really help people get back to work and help the county grow. The, you know, Montgomery County, look, I've, I've been a resident for 30, year, 30 years. I've worked in this county for more than 30 years. The county has challenges. There's no, no question. Our tax base had issues before the pandemic. And it is vital that we address that because this is a county that has a broad social agenda and we need the funds to be able to, to do that. Uh, both of our speakers talked about our reality. You know, perception about the county is, is reality and people felt that this is a, a very difficult place to do business. While I might not agree with everybody on all fronts, we faced our challenges as a real estate developer in this county for the last couple of decades and we know there are things that can be improved. Uh, and there were things that had started. The, the county council approved a plan early last year. The economic development team's been working hard. But, you know, we had a pandemic shock. And, you know, I think the main goal of the economic advisory group is to realize what that shock did and how we can move forward. The reality is, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, as I say. So now we are now got these opportunities that we have to look at where we are and how we got forward. The EAG is a group of three dozen predominantly private sector uh, folks, big and small, as the county executive said, who care about the community and want to help us move forward and improve. Uh, the county executive mentioned how short we have been working. Um, most people who know me know there's not gonna be a long report and we're not gonna study things forever. But what we're really trying to do is the EAG is set the table, lay the foundation, be a spark to move things forward. So we have things that we want to talk about that are near and long-term. And we want to, uh, as the council president reminded me as we were wrapping up our work, we want people to be accountable and we want to be held accountable for what we recommend. So we're going to have actionable items for people to do. If uh, you can put the slides up real quick, I'm going to walk through a couple of the 
couple of the highlights of the report. I know the full report will be issued uh, to everybody shortly. As, as we say right here, this is an economic roadmap to recovery and long-term success. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, I'm sorry, go one more. I'll come back to that. So as we look at it, there, there, this county is positioned maybe better than any other county in this country to recover from where we are today. While we've been slow in the past, if you look at what we have today and where we are, we're in a tremendous place to, to succeed both today and for generations to come. Uh, it was talked about where we are as maybe the third or fourth largest life sciences market in the country, but that's the private sector market. We are, we are the epicenter. We are the largest place in the nation if you look at all of our life sciences assets. So what is Montgomery County positioned to do? It is to build on its competitive advantage in the life and regulatory sciences that Ron's gonna talk about. We should establish leadership roles in healthcare technology. And the, as the world changes here, the application of AI and quantum computing on business, we've got tremendous resources in the county and the state to take advantage of that. And one thing that's not always focused on is Montgomery County is a leader in the hospitality sector. We have more headquarters located in Montgomery County in the hospitality sector than anywhere else in the country. And we know how hard hit that industry has been, but that industry will come back. So we wanna help them recover and then help them grow in the future. You go back one slide, please. So what did the economic advisory group really did? We focused on four key objectives where we could really see the county making a difference. The first one is on improving our talent, and Angela's gonna talk about that. Montgomery County today has 1,500 open life sciences positions. We need to create more talent to help industry grow. Two, we gotta improve our speed to market. And the economic development world is changing. Economic development is not about incentives anymore, it's about investment. So what the county executive mentioned is, really looking at a way so we can invest in this county and give certainty of making improvements to the county. Third, addressing the access and availability of capital. It's always been a challenge coming out of the pandemic. It's even a bigger challenge. And lastly, while it's not as long-term as some of the other objectives, we really need to help our industry's most hard hit that really make a difference in our quality of life, restaurants, entertainment, hospitality. And I know the county council approved some funding in that area yesterday at that meeting that will help. So we've got a big broad agenda. We've got a lot of things we want to do. We're excited about the way industry and the county has come together with our roadmap. And I'm going to turn this over now to Ron to talk about the life sciences and regulatory sciences area that we really hope will be a key to our future. Thank you, Doug. Um, I'm a proud resident of Montgomery County myself and was really pleased to have this opportunity and to be asked to participate. Uh, just briefly, the, the USP, United States Pharmacopeia, um, celebrated our 200th anniversary this year. Uh, we're a global scientific nonprofit that sets public quality medicine standards enforced under US law and actually recognized in 50 other countries around the world. I set that context because we've been headquartered here in Montgomery County since the 1950s. We've grown since then. We had one staff member in 1950, and now we have eight, over 800 today in Rockville alone, with additional offices with over 400 staff in 12 other countries. We're here for a good reason in Montgomery County, USP. It's because we work between the US federal agencies um, quite a bit with FDA, but also NIH and, and NIST, NIST, and to the US biopharma industry. That's the space we exist in with our quality standards. These are both extremely well established in our county, just as Doug said, and I would go further. And that this mix, this, this unique mix in the county is unique in the world. The FDA is the leading regulator in the world. USP is the largest pharmacopeia setting medicine standards in the world. We're among the leaders in biopharma, including in, in vaccines and beyond. This is more than unique, it's, it's extraordinary. And that isn't even mentioning the NIH for basic research. But further, I'd say USP is an example of what it looks like when you have this sort of effort in the life sciences in Montgomery County. Our 800 staff in Rockville, more than half of ours are trained scientists. At, at the bachelor's, actually the most are at master's and PhD level. But also to support a full, well-rounded organization, 
We have hundreds from diverse disciplines, including finance, human resources, facilities, information technology, communications, you name it. So what about this mix then? This mix of regulatory bodies and biopharma and how, what can we do to take more advantage of it? I think the truth is today, it's, it's, it's not really thought of that way. Um, certainly people think about FDA being in the location, but there isn't, the connections aren't being made and they can be, there's a huge opportunity for those connections to be made more proactively with targeted investments. We believe that the combination of the talent as well as the, the, the literal assets of having regulatory expertise in industry is something that is profoundly important in the world. We see it in the approval and the process for COVID vaccines and therapeutics, which is for us at USP, our number one priority for this year, as you can imagine. I'm really pleased to be able to introduce now Angela Glam, who, uh, as Doug described, is the president and CEO of Quality Biological, to talk a little bit more about this last piece, talent. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, everyone. Um, I know I'm standing between everyone and Dr. Gale, so I will be very brief. Um, but I did want to uh, talk a little bit about um, this, this uh, training program that the EAG we've, we've developed and we're very excited about. Um, first, let me back up and introduce myself. I'm Angela Graham. I am Quality Biological and I am a lifelong resident of Montgomery County. So I am very committed to making sure that we do what we can to help everyone recover um, from COVID. And so one of the things that we thought about is some of the short-term things that we could possibly come up with that would help us retain our, our residents and provide an opportunity to learn a new skill to possibly enter a new industry. And as Ron was saying that the biosciences regulatory, it's a great opportunity. We're expanding in the county. So what better way than to possibly try to um, increase the, the, the talent pool that's locally grown. So in partnership with Montgomery College, the University of Shady Grove, we have developed an exciting bio boot camp. Now this is a pilot and it's a very aggressive pilot, but it's a tuition free training opportunity that will be held at two locations, the Pickman Innovation Center on the Germantown campus of Montgomery College and the Biomedical Sciences and Engineering Building on the campus of the University of Shady Grove. It's four weeks, very intensive, that in collaboration with industry partners, we developed a program that will teach the lab skills needed for many of the entry-level positions in our local life science companies. So these, these skill sets are critical for success in any lab environment, gowning, pipetting, contamination control, um, aseptic technique, clean room practices. These are just examples of what these partic participants will um, learn during this four week um, training program. And upon completion, graduates will interview for employment with the industry partners. So as you can see, our goal is twofold. So provide employment opportunities for county residents displaced by COVID, as well as increase the talent pool for local life science ecosystem. And if successful, we plan to scale the program and offer it on a regular basis. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think I'm next to McHugh. Uh, thank you as always for the opportunity to be with you all. And just to highlight the fantastic work from all of the industry leaders and experts who aren't only just local and regional experts, they are experts throughout the world. And we're very blessed and fortunate to have their expertise in our backyard. It also represents how closely science and business and economic can work together very closely in general, but particularly as we continue to move forward in terms of our COVID response. And certainly as has been referenced and as you have probably followed along at home in the last week or so, you have seen the, the importance of that type of synergy increase as our numbers have continued to rise. Um, as of this morning, uh, we reported over 170 cases and the state reported over 1,400. Uh, and this is consistent over the last several days where we have actually seen some record numbers from the state as well as some higher than expected averages locally. Our test positivity is over four. It's at 4.3% today. Uh, I was at 4.8 yesterday. Uh, and so we continue to monitor that. Our rate of transmission is over 1.4 and our cases per 100,000 are at uh, 19, I'm sorry, all right, just shy of 19 today. Uh, as of this morning, 20 of the 24 
jurisdictions throughout the state have case rates of greater than 10 per 100,000. And over 10 of those have uh, great case rates greater than 20 per 100,000. We continue to monitor our hospital utilization. And unfortunately, last week when our press conference, we talked about how those numbers had not gone up. We have seen increases in those numbers or we started to see uh, increases in those numbers uh, in terms of emergency room utilization, uh, intensive care utilization, as well as acute bed usage overall. We've met with our hospital leaders this week to dust off, if you will, our surge playbook that we used early on in the pandemic, and they are ready to go, and we are ready to go to continue to provide their much support, uh, and we will continue to address any challenges that they may have in terms of uh, dealing with any individuals who are coming into the hospital setting. One thing I wanna emphasize is that what they reported is they are starting to see, unlike the first wave of cases back in the spring, they're starting to see a higher percentage of young people, young being defined as those who are under the age of 30, showing up into the hospital and requiring hospitalization. That's important to note because I know throughout the pandemic, the perception has been young people can get it, but they're less likely to have symptoms and they're less likely to have complications. Less likely doesn't mean zero chance. And that's the thing we wanna emphasize for folks at home in terms of understanding and perceiving the risk that you may have in terms of the activities that you have moving forward. Now, we've talked a lot about the restrictions that we've put into place. As the county executive mentioned, there are a host of other jurisdictions who have introduced uh, further restrictions, and we'd be happy to address your questions further on that perspective. In the interest of time, I will stop there to allow for a greater discussion and uh, discourse. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gales, and everyone who spoke and presented. Um, we do appreciate the information. We will now see if we have any questions uh, from our media partners. Uh, I believe there's a question from Chris Gordon. All right, Mr. Gordon. All right, I've unmuted. Uh, thank you very much for this update. Uh, um, today, Prince George's County um, announced uh, new restrictions. Last week, uh, when you introduced the executive order and restrictions in Montgomery County, Dr. Stoddard uh, said, uh, I think by next week, we will not be alone. Uh, prescient, probably just a preview. Uh, so uh, the question I have is, where are we going? Um, they have reduced uh, indoor um, capacity now at Prince George's County to 10. I think that restriction is even tighter than, than Montgomery County, which I believe is uh, 25 or 25 percent, whichever is less. Uh, so, um, and Governor Cuomo talked about 10, 10, 10, closing bars and restaurants at 10 o'clock, uh, reducing a bar uh, gyms to 10. Um, are we going to the number 10? I understand yesterday there was some discussion uh, in Montgomery County about uh, uh, further restrictions. So with the trends you see, before you, you kind of gave us uh, the preview of what's coming two weeks out, it came. Where are we going from here? Um, well, just from my perspective, you know, one of the challenges we've had is obviously last week we went out alone. And we've been trying to reach consensus positions. And so some of what we did was to try to not be so far an outlier last week, as in going to 10 would have made us. Um, but, you know, I think all of us recognize that 10 is actually a better number for human beings than, than 25. And we will look at what the other jurisdictions are doing. I do think at least on a, on gatherings, um, 10 is probably the right number. Uh, you know, since we went into stage two, we've done nothing but watch our numbers go up. And this was totally predictable. Um, I don't know why anybody thought that COVID was over and done with and we could just start going back toward normal. Um, we need a little bit more work to do on this. Hopefully an administration that takes COVID seriously would be nice. Um, but I think, you know, all the county executives are trying now to get ourselves aligned and we're gonna be part of that. And 
Um, my question is also to, to Dr. Stoddard and, and Dr. Gales on, on where you think uh, this should go. Uh, Prince George's County also today, if I'm not mistaken, uh, required masks, required yeah. for everyone outdoors. Well, I think we have to continue again to watch the trends as the county executive mentioned. And, you know, we've been talking about the increase in cases and, um, you know, hypothesizing that this could happen uh, some weeks ago. And so I think that a first line of restrictions that we propose that could be tweaked again to be aligned with uh, our regional peers and partners uh, is possible. And then I think the, the big question is, is what impact will that have? I think all of us, again, are being very mindful of the consequences of restri the restrictions being put into place, certainly also being guided by the understanding of the trends, whether we're looking at cases, hospitalizations, and, and God forbid, more COVID-related fatalities. And so I think the, to your question in terms of extrapolating what will happen next, I think that will be dependent upon what impact these restrictions have in place. Uh, and I do fear, and I think it's shared across the healthcare continuum, that if they do not have a, a significant improvement in those numbers and the numbers actually worsen, that we would be most likely providing guidance that would uh, require further restrictions put on uh, businesses and social activities. And I'll just add to that that, um, you know, you know, we were aware that some of the jurisdictions we're discussing last week, and, you know, obviously we're some of those jurisdictions restrictions have been forward with with um with with restrictions but i will say that i do believe that the the our being out there and being willing to be first did encourage some of those other jurisdictions to be in some cases more aggressive than they would have been had we not done anything and so you know i, I definitely appreciate the county executive and the county council for being willing to be a little bit out in front of and, and show some leadership here um, I think as Dr. Yell's already said, we're gonna need seven to 10 days to evaluate the impacts of the first measures uh, to really understand what will happen next. I think we've kind of talked about this, that um, our first goal was to not do any closures of any particular industries, but rather to focus on the, the capacity limits. And that's what we've done through this first executive order. The second round, as it were, we, we do not wanna to have to do it, but if it, we did do it, we would have to consider uh, uh, targeted closures of particular uh, businesses or industries where we've seen a higher correlation in terms of the contact tracing data uh, and where their gatherings are, you know, um, you know, larger and or uh, involve not use of face coverings or other things like that. And so those are all being things that we're actively discussing right now in preparation for what could happen. And again, we are not we take no pleasure in having to implement any of these changes. We do not want to have to do them. We hope that the measures that we've already taken will prove to be uh, effective in, re in, in slowing the spread. But I think Dr. Gales has already said it. We're concerned that, that will not happen and we need to be prepared for what happens next if it doesn't. And the last thing I will say is um, we learn from our neighboring jurisdictions in the same way that they learn from us. We do not have a monopoly on good ideas for how we can control this virus, this novel virus. And so when this 10 person thing came along that, that New York and, and even Prince George's County is now doing, I think it's, it's um, you know, we're gonna take a hard look at that. I know the, the, the modification of the face coverings that Prince George's County has done, we probably can take a look at that. Uh, we learn from others and what they're doing and what they're effective in doing as much as they learn from us. And so I think that's part of what we'll have to do as we see more jurisdictions coming on board. Okay, see, we have a question from Kate Ryan with WTOP. Thank you very much. I have uh, two questions. One on um, uh, the letter that uh, went out to the governor from the uh, county leaders in the region. Um, since then, of course, the governor has made, uh, you know, imposed more restrictions. He's going to address, uh, make an address this afternoon. Um, do you all, Dr. Gay? Uh, um, County Executive Elrich and Dr. Stoddard, do you feel the first rollback went far enough? And what are you looking for this afternoon? And then to Dr. Stoddard and to Dr. Gales, I'm hearing of a report of a Halloween party that involved 75 teenagers, <clears throat> many of whom attend a private school in DC. 
and that citations would be coming based on that gathering. Can you confirm that? Uh, I will definitely be happy to answer the second question. Uh, I'll jump in on the first and then come back to the second one. Um, so I think in terms of the, the uh, what the governor announced, I will say this in addition to the, the letter that the county executive mentioned, the health officers did actually, you know, has put forward a set of recommendations related to uh, actual requirements as opposed to suggestions uh, related to capacity limits, much like we discussed here, creating a statewide set of guidelines that would uh, create a standardized approach, leaving you know the flexibility for local jurisdictions to be able to take even more restrictive measures to address the specifics of their their communities. Um, but you know, we would we would like to have seen, at least from a health perspective, uh, some guidance around capacity limits, um, guidance around you know enforcement penalties and those kinds of things, as well as some guidance around criteria for closure. Um, and so, you know, because the challenge is, is each of the local jurisdictions have to do this dance of working together or thinking about, well, what are you going to do? What are we going to do uh, in terms of what are the community transmission levels that are not safe to keep your businesses open, not safe to keep your schools open, not safe for sports? To, to happen. And in the absence of statewide guidance in those spaces, it creates a space where each jurisdiction is working to try to figure out um, that information on its own. Now, certainly we do appreciate there are times where we do need to make things more specific to our areas, recognizing the broad diversity of the state. Uh, but, you know, we, we would like to have seen uh, there are some spaces that aren't gray areas where statewide guidance would have been beneficial. So I'll just say from my perspective, it, it was, it left me a little bit disappointed um, when he talks about strongly recommending. I mean, I felt like he just needed to bite the bullet and say, you know, not that you should do this, but you must do this. I think we're at a must point. And if, if these don't, if the numbers don't change with should, he's going to be back in two weeks having to do must anyway. And I think this is, this is the problem with taking half measures on some of this stuff. You know what kind of curve you're on. And, you know, we know that a lot of these measures actually were, a lot of the problems we face came because at least some of us feel that some of these measures were put in place, place prematurely. Going back to, you know, to a standard that you, that you implemented when cases were nowhere near as bad as they are now is probably not enough right now. And so I wish he had done, I wish he'd used the word must more than he used the word should. And I wish there had been more direct uh, direction for dealing, dealing with this. Um, we'll see what comes out of his press conference today, but his numbers aren't getting any better. Ours weren't getting any better. Um, it wasn't that long ago when, you know, we were really happy with, you know, cases well under 10 per 100,000. And I think this morning we were 19.3. And we're one of the least open places. So I, I wish he had gone farther. And I really think an important contrast from what we saw in the spring, um, and this isn't specifically to the governor, but in the spring, we saw COVID be more restricted to the bigger jurisdictions and the, and the more rural, less populated wow. counties did not experience the surge in the spring uh, the way the big counties did. This time around, it is every county essentially across the state. The highest case rate per 100,000 is in Allegheny County, which is a very different county from Montgomery County. So whereas the restrictions uh, in the spring, the governor was willing to make statewide restrictions, uh, even though there was less impact in some of the rural counties, he's less willing to make statewide restrictions or has not made statewide restrictions to this point, even though the entire state is experiencing the surge and some of the rural counties experiencing it more than the larger counties are. And so it, it, it's, an imperial, it's an important contrast to what we saw in the spring because, you know, we're seeing record statewide case levels, even though the biggest jurisdictions aren't experiencing records because every small jurisdiction is seeing a surge in that way. And so this is a bit different of a surge than what we saw in the spring. And, and 
we certainly hope that the governor will show statewide leadership because not just because we are looking for political cover for, for doing what we're doing, but because the benefits can be more realized if you do them on a larger scale than if you just do them on a county by county level, number one. And number two, the inconsistency between what the state's saying and what, what Prince George's County is saying, and what Montgomery County is saying, leads to challenges for businesses in understanding exactly what their requirements are, particularly because many businesses operate across different borders, have different, you know, different, different uh, offices in different counties, and they'll have to follow different rules. And so we very much would like to see the governor come out with some, with the, some more stringent and, and universal statewide guidance so that we can all be operating along the same pathway. Gotcha. And on enforcement of gatherings, I know, again, you've mentioned gatherings are a real problem. And this apparently was a Halloween party. Again, this is what I'm hearing. I need to confirm it. But 75 people at a single gathering. Um, Dr. Stoddard, can you talk about whether or not that's actually, accurate? So actually, Kate, I can answer that for you. Uh, so there, there, you are correct. Uh, there was a gathering uh, located in Montgomery County. Um, however, it was first reported through uh, individuals who attended a school, a non-public school in D.C., and the D.C. Department of Health uh, conducted the initial contact tracing and reached out to our staff um, once the location of the, the party was discovered uh, uh, approximately two days ago, and our team has been following up uh, to get a, a sense of how many folks are impacted. Um, as of this morning, as best as I can tell, just strictly for looking at the Montgomery County residents who were in attendance of, in that party, um, we have potentially over 30 residents from Montgomery County who were in attendance of the party, and, and over 15 of them have tested positive so far. Um, and so I, I can't comment any further in terms of, you know, students or, or adults who were from other areas who attended the party. Again, recognizing that the school is located in D.C., um, but as it stands, we have at least 15 county residents who tested positive secondary to attending that party. Now, as it relates to citations and those kind of things, we're continuing to conduct the investigation to find out more information, to get, again, a full sense of what exactly transpired uh, and what happened in that setting to enhance transmission, in addition to the fact that it was a party held anyway that uh, looks like uh, potentially, I'm not sure, but potentially violated a number of our, our guidelines. And once we've completed that investigation, we will take the necessary action uh, according to the regulations. And I, I would just say a little bit, a little bit beyond what Dr. Bielsa said, um, we have done enforcement on our businesses. We would not view uh, private parties in any differently. So if there were violations of the order and we've issued citations to businesses for similar violations, we would absolutely issue violations to, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not speaking specifically about this case, the investigation is ongoing, but just that there is no separation between a private gathering and a business gathering. If we would issue a citation for a business gathering, we similarly would issue one for a private gathering found to have violated the rules and uh, put people at risk. Okay, um, I wanted to give a quick reminder to those watching us on County Cable Montgomery and on Facebook that this uh, stream will end at 1.20. Um, the recording of the call uh, will be available to you later this afternoon on the county's YouTube page and on Facebook as well. Uh, for members of the media, we will continue on the Zoom call <laughs> until we have, have gotten through all of your questions. And with that, we have a question from Brianna at Bethesda Beat. Yes, thank you. I have a, a couple questions for Dr. Gales and Dr. Stoddard. Uh, first for Dr. Gales, um, what is the current hospital bed capacity in the county? I know the COVID related bed utilization is 10.6% according to the dashboard, uh, but how many beds do the hospitals have set aside for COVID patients now? Um, and you mentioned that the hospitals are seeing more young people. Um, uh, compared to the spring. Are there any other differences from the spring or trends that we're seeing in hospitalizations? Uh, good afternoon, it's a great question. So for the first question, we can get those numbers. I don't have the exact figures in terms of the beds that are available um, because what happens is, is that each of the hospitals have their uh, capacity set up in different ways in terms of how they utilize and repurpose the different spaces. So we'd have to follow up and provide that information uh, to you following the call. Um, but what I can say is that I know at least 
Um, one of the facilities in Germantown was at in the red zone for capacity related to their intensive care beds uh, yesterday, meaning that I think they had one bed of it, one ICU bed available. Uh, and so those are the kinds of numbers that we would look to. Now, what we've noticed so far is again, even if we've you know seen those slow, steady increases, that plateau that we sat at, sat at for about a month and a half. Uh, where we didn't see any downward downward movement, and now you know we saw the slowly slow increase, and then kind of doubled over the last week, is that the hospitalization numbers weren't going up, but now when as they've steadily gone up over the last week, and this is just a small window, you know it is a greater diversity in the age distribution. In the first wave of the pandemic, we saw it was primarily those who were over the age of 40 and 50 years old, both in terms of who were hospitalized, both in terms of who were uh, had longer hospital courses, as well as the COVID-related fatalities. So I think so far in the early stages of this increase, it has been primarily just a more diverse age distribution in comparison to the first wave. And I still think it's too early to tease out any other demographic trends, but we certainly will continue to follow and update the public as needed. I would also add, Thank you. we are similarly seeing an increase on the EMS side. So we are transporting more what we define as PUI, well, what the, uh, the uh, state and county define as PUIs, which are persons under investigation, which are suspect COVID patients. We are seeing an increase. Um, we're, you know, in the 25-ish range every day for people who meet that uh, standard. In addition, even those people who uh, we, we measure, for example, oxygen sat saturation in our transport characteristics, and we're seeing an increase, uh, increase uh, uh, oxygen levels, which tends to correlate well with COVID-19 increases. And so we are seeing it on an EMS level. We're seeing it uh, in terms of uh, uh, EMS staff who are being uh, quarantined because they're getting, they're not getting exposed to work, but they're getting exposed in their personal lives. So like we, we, we see it through multiple different avenues uh, where COVID is increasing across the county. We're seeing it in the hospitalizations. So when we talk about, and I think even the governor referenced this too, you know, we try and boil things down all to a two or three different metrics, but we're looking at dozens of metrics every day and trying to get a picture of where things are at and, and factoring in things like hospitalization rates in, 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 our, in our planning. But we are seeing across the board increases. And I think the trouble that we are concerned about is if you look at other jurisdictions, not, not in Maryland, but you know, uh, Wisconsin and Mich Minnesota, uh, Michigan, they're seeing, they've seen hospital or they've seen surges in cases that preceded surges in hospitalization. And now they're starting to see the surges in deaths. And that's the thing that we're most concerned about is we're, we're already starting to see the uptick in hospitalizations that has, you know, it lagged our case increases by a couple of weeks. Now what's going to happen in two more weeks? Are we going to see the hospitalizations become more of the story and the deaths start to tick up too? And that's the thing that we're paying a lot of attention to. Thank you. And, and Dr. Stoddard, um, could you provide an update on the county's stockpile of personal protective equipment and other supplies? Um, and are the hospitals creating their own separate stockpiles? Um, and do you specifically have a number of ventilators that are in the county? So a few things on that. So yes, we've got over 13 million uh, masks, a combination of N95s, K95s, and surgical masks. Um, the, the hospitals are similarly uh, stocking up and have been stocking up. Uh, we have actually had conversations with and actually owe a call back to one of our hospitals on uh, one model of masks that they have not been able to acquire and we're going to help them try and acquire some of those, for example. Um, we've been doing an assessment of those as well. The other side is uh, the county back in April and over the summer did, did receive a shipment of 50 ventilators that we actually have at the county level uh, that we will distribute to the hospitals whenever they get to the point where they're or their own internal um, resources have been tapped out. And so uh, um, that, was a, that was a procurement that we did make and, and will help with our surge capacity. Uh, as you will recall, back in the spring, there were a few cases where we had to rapidly move ventilators around because the number of ventilated patients at some of the hospitals uh, did exceed the number of ventilators that they had. And we had to actually move some of our transport ventilators to fill that gap. We feel like we're in a much better position with the ventilators that we have uh, in Montgomery County now than where we were in the spring. And um, we're hope, we, I mean, we, we continue to hope that those ventilators stay right where they're at in their boxes. 
but if we need to deploy them out, we will deploy them out to all the hospitals and they'll be there and available to support ventilated patients throughout the county. I would also, just on the same point, uh, we've been really working with our uh, nursing homes and assisted living facilities as well to make sure that they have stockpiles similar to our hospitals because we know that that's one of the common avenues uh, of, of where PP is often needed. Uh, and I will continue to reiterate that the county, the county is a backstop to those organizations, meaning if they cannot acquire or run out of, for some reason, the PPE, we are not going to allow them to be without PPE in the spring, we started this event with very little PPE and had to sort of provide what we could in all cases. Uh, we believe we're in a much better position as a county to backstop the needs of those front-facing healthcare organizations. That is 50 ventilators, uh, 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 Kate, uh, five zero. Are there any other questions from anyone? Looking now. Kevin Lewis has a question for everyone. Kevin, go ahead. Hey, thanks, guys. County Executive Elrich, uh, I was streaming the hearing on Tuesday regarding hazard pay. Uh, and just wanted to ask, there seemed to be uh, a difference in opinion if this was accidental in nature or malicious in nature. Wanted to get your sense on that. And second to it, wanted to see if uh, you and the administration are working to recoup the money that was paid out um, to the employees that I guess didn't deserve it, according to the OIG report. Yeah, um, much to talk about. Look, um, I, it, it was a decision made by a manager. <clears throat> so I just want to disabuse people of the notion that we were that 75 employees conspired to submit reports that weren't, submit reports of their time that weren't accurate. That's not what they did. Their, the department head, the acting department head, made a decision and told people that he would pay them the full front-facing pay. And so this was his mistake. The county was really clear. We, we sent out regular updates to people about how, how this pay was supposed to be handled, who got front-facing pay, how you had to balance it between hours spent front-facing and hours either spent in an office or spent at home. If you were in the office, you got a lower rate of differential. If you worked from home, you didn't get a differential for those hours. And the manager simply said, um, all of you are gonna get front-facing pay. I haven't talked to him. I only know what I've heard anecdotally. Um, he's not here now because he was the acting manager and he, he is no longer in that job. Uh, when the department head got a, well, I know that the IG got a, got a report of this or got alerted to this in May. When the manager of the department, the new department head, Mitra, found out about it, it wasn't until the end of August. Nobody told her. And as soon as, and she also wasn't told then. So when the IG started asking questions, Mitra figured out what she was looking at and went herself to see what, this, what her department was doing, found that they had this order to pay front-facing pay and she reversed it and, and implemented the correct pay system. <laughs> so when our manager was told, the manager fixed it, which is what I would want them to do. 
I don't know if we're going to be able to get the pay back because this, if this were a case of employees falsifying their timesheets and violating our policy, there would be no, no doubt that we would get the money back. But that's not the case here. In this case, we're dealing with something where employees were told this is how they were going to get paid. And the fault is not theirs, it is somebody else's. We are going through all the other departments. You know, there are some departments that almost all the pay is front facing. If you're dealing with bus drivers, if you're dealing with police and fire and corrections and the other jobs where people are constantly uh, run the risk of being exposed. So there's not any question about that. And that's the bulk of the people who get front facing pay. And we're looking at the other positions to make sure that a similar decision was either not implemented in any other department or that members of the departments did not do anything wrong themselves. But in this case, the employees of the county did not do anything wrong. They benefited, unfortunately, by a mistake that a manager made. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you everyone. That was our final question. I want to thank all our media partners for attending and thank all of our presenters for the information and special thanks to the Economic Advisory Group Chair Doug Persenberg and those members for the program that they are standing up. Um, we thank you for your attendance. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.